JBS presents the Hampton Synagogue's Author Discussion Series with Rabbi Avraham Bronstein. My name is Glenn Dorskin. Welcome to the Hampton Synagogue. The Hampton Synagogue Author Discussion Series, now in its 27th year, is a cultural highlight of our summer season, both for members of our congregation and our many visitors from across the Hamptons. I am proud to serve as series chair, and it is my great pleasure to share our past season with you, our global congregation, in celebration of Jewish Book Month. pages from the beginning, and then I'll look at you and see if I should go on. <laughs> uh, so this is the very beginning of the book. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. The space that Israel occupies in the U.S. political debate is by any measure extraordinary. In land area, the Jewish state ranks 149th on a list of 195 independent nations. It is smaller than Belize and El Salvador, and only slightly larger than Slovenia. And yet, despite its size and despite its distance from the United States, Israel, and particularly its conflict with the Palestinians and surrounding nations, remains one of the most intensely debated topics in all of American politics. The participants in these debates often treat competing arguments not as matters of policy, but as challenges to their personal identities. This tendency has long been evident among American Jews, but in recent decades, it has also become true of millions of conservative Christians. More and more, it is evident in Israel's opponents as well. This identity infused inflexibility is one of the main causes of the debate's intensity and one reason why arguments so often veer away from any recognizable reality experienced by the people who actually live there. This book is a history of, is a history of the debate over Israel in the United States about its founding, its character, its conflicts, and many other issues. It pays particular attention to the actions and concerns of American Jews, as they have historically stood at the center of the debate, oftentimes defining its terms and policing its borders. It is not a book about Israel, US diplomacy in the Middle East, or the fate of the Palestinian people inside or outside Israel's borders, however one might define these. My shelves were already groaning with books on those topics, as I hope to make clear in the coming pages, actual events in and around Israel and the arguments that Americans have about them are birds of decidedly different feathers. While Middle Eastern realities undoubtedly do play a role in determining the contours of the U.S. debate, they do so in unpredictable, often irrational ways. Over time, the American debate over Israel ultimately turns on its own axis, with a center located not in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, but in midtown Manhattan in Washington, D.C., it is in this, quote, public sphere, as defined in 1962 by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, where I find my focus. Should I continue? Okay, I think that's good. Okay. Thank you. So that, I think, flows very nice, neatly into the first question, where you mentioned just in that um, bit of your introduction, there are so many books that are written about Israel or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the modern Middle East in general or even American policy towards all of those. Um, what motivated you to write a different book, so to write this book, and um, what niche does this book fill that you think was left unattended by everything else that has been written until now? Well. I get asked that first question. It's usually the first question I get asked. Um, why did I write this book? And um, I'm really two people as the author of this book. Uh, the first person I am and the first person I try to be is a historian who looks at the evidence and comes to certain conclusions regardless of what my own political beliefs or religion or upbringing might be. So that anyone who 
Uh, you don't have to agree with me on politics, hardly anybody does, um, to, to find my arguments and evidence compelling. You know, I have a PhD in history, and I take that very seriously. Um, but I'm also uh, a liberal American Jew. And, uh, as, and I've been raised, you know, in that tradition. And, um, and Israel has been a part of my life since uh, I went. Uh, my parents sent me on a, on a teen tour. Funnily enough, it was with the Zionist Organization of America, the most right-wing of all Jewish organizations. Um, now, I don't think so. Back then, it was 1974. I was there um, during the Entebbe rescue, I, as I recall. Uh, they sent me back again in two years later, in 1976, on a work tour. And then I went uh, for a semester in college uh, in 1980, right immediately after the peace treaty was signed with uh, Egypt. My friends and I took one of the very first Egged buses all the way from Tel Aviv to Cairo. And, um, and I attended what I think must be the only Egyptian-Israeli academic, joint academic conference uh, at the university, Tel Aviv University, where I was. So um, I've, been, I've been involved. Uh, you know, it, it had an, a Hebrew school almost ruined me as a Jew, but Israel sort of rescued me in that respect. Um, and, uh, and I think that was, that's very common of Jews of my generation. Um, so uh, I grew up, you know, and I, and I had all these jobs with various magazines and political organizations, and I, I, I never could let go of it. Um, I've always been, uh, I've written hundreds of articles about uh, Israel and the United States and Israel and American Jewish organizations and the fights and so forth. So it's, it's been a wound in my heart in many ways. Uh, in many ways, it's been just an uh, enormous interest. Um, I actually wrote my honors thesis in college um, on the, on the uh, Six-Day War and the relationship, its relationship to American liberalism. Um, I've always felt that liberalism and Zionism have been in tension with one another. Um, that was back in 1982, 40 years ago. I saved my notes. I was that much of a nerd. Um, Ten years later, when I was getting my doctorate, I spent a year thinking I was going to do a dissertation on um, the founding of the State of Israel on the, and its effect on American liberalism. But I'll tell you something about American Jews you might not know. They don't shut up. They write a lot. When you write a dissertation, the purpose of a dissertation, uh, at least in history, is to show that you know absolutely everything about your topic. You don't have to say anything particularly new. You just have to show your competence that you, you're aware of every single argument that's been made. And that's just not possible because Jews write too much. So I gave up that. Uh, but I saved those notes, too. And that was 30 years ago. So finally, uh, in 2015, I signed the contract to write this book. And uh, I had two specific aims in that respect. One was, uh, as I imply in the introduction to the book, I find it almost impossible to have a conversation about Israel for two reasons. One is, people don't listen to people who disagree with them. They just get angry and change the subject. What aboutism is the most common response to, uh, you know, what about, what about this? What about that, you know? And the second thing is, everything is really complicated. Everything about Israel, particularly Israel and the Palestinians, but everything about Israel itself is incredibly complicated. And it took me 512 pages, of which 66 are uh, academic notes, footnotes and so forth, um, to get to the bottom of what, was the, what, what actually happened and what was the debate about it and what was, the, if any, was their relationship between the two and what effect did that have because there's a feedback loop between these things. So... I just want to pick up a little bit on that, because at the end of your book, you, um, you quote Joan Didion, who um, was speaking, much as you just said about how so many conversations about Israel kind of go nowhere. Arguments don't really go anyplace. Uh, she called those conversations uh, toxic, 
potentially lethal, the conversational equivalent of an unclaimed bag on a bus, right? meaning like it's about to explode, right. and people just run you know, for cover until it can be safely diffused. If that's kind of the context that you identify around these conversations, so what does it say about you that you took this on to write a book? Well, one, I have tenure. <laughs> um, no, I actually, um, like I said, uh, it, it's complicated, and I don't, I don't want to, you don't know me, and uh, we're just starting, so I don't, I don't want to say anything too incendiary in the beginning of our conversation, but I do use the word police its borders, that American Jewish organizations have policed the borders of what it, it's fair to say about Israel and still be respectable and not have to worry about losing your job or being called an anti-Semite, et cetera. What's funny about this, it's, it's funny is, not funny ha-ha, funny ironic, I suppose, is that those borders are always shifting and you never know exactly where they are. So the things that were unsayable that would have gotten you in trouble and maybe cost you your job uh, 10 years ago or five years ago are, are, are perfectly all right today. Um, sometimes they go backwards. Uh, so I, I thought I had a pretty good idea of where they stood today and that what I was, the things that I had to say would, fit, would, would be all right. People would be able to accept it and, 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 uh, and discuss it um, fairly. I'm not sure I was right about that. Okay. I, I think part of that is that you know, even between America and Israel, certain words are acceptable in one discourse and not in the other, depending on where the conversation is. Yeah, well, historically, things were much more open in Israel than they were in the United States. Uh, historically, uh, people were calling for a Palestinian state right after the 67 war. Um, and, uh, and you couldn't do that in the United States. You couldn't do that until many uh, decades later. Um, and criticism of, the, say, the Israeli army was much more vocal in those days. Um, I guess they felt like they had earned the right to say whatever they wanted to say, since they were the people involved, and in many cases doing the fighting. Um, but I also think, and this is one of the main themes of the book, is that there was a, a, a fictional, almost Disney, Disney-fied version of Israel created for the purposes of American Jewish identity. And anything that conflicted with that, um, that mythical Israel was shut down. And I think today, for many reasons, one, because the conflict has gone on so long, the occupation has gone on for so long, but also because of the rise of social media where everybody has their own sources, that it's no longer possible to police that uh, debate as it, as it was policed in the past. Mm -hmm. so I'm interested in the title of the book. The, you know, sub, you know, the main title yeah. is We Are Not One. I'm wondering who you mean by we. What do you mean we, Kimo Sami? Um, Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I like the title, even though it's, it's only really clear to me. Um, <laughs> the title, the We Are Not One, has three meanings uh, simultaneously. One is, is that clearly America and Israel are not the same country, even though there's an insistence among many people that they should have exactly the same policies and that there should be no distance between the two. Uh, Number two, American Jews and Israeli Jews live, have very different lived experiences. And they are not one. They may have a lot in common. They may love each other. You, they may be your relatives. You may care deeply about them. But again, I grew up in Scarsdale. You know, There's no Scarsdale in Israel. Um, it's very different. I didn't serve in the military. You know? um, I don't have, I'm not occupying anyone else's land. Um, and third, uh, American Jews are no longer one, if they ever were. Uh, it, I, I'm grateful to be having this conversation in a synagogue, but actually very few rabbis will talk about Israel anymore because their congregations are so divided on the issue. And again, it's really, really hard to talk about Israel unless people share exactly the same assumptions. And I mean exactly the same assumptions. I, 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 I mean, 
uh, again, I try not to talk about it at all with friends because there, if, you, if you diverge on anything, then it, uh, the person sort of digs in and, um, and they, don't, they don't hear what you're saying. They just get angry and wait for you to finish so they can change the subject. So um, I think that's true in, in, uh, in the American Jewish community. If you look at um, recent surveys, uh, you know, um, the, it, it's kind of, in the media, when the media talk about American Jewish views of Israel, they usually go to organizations like the AJC or the ADL or APAC, and, and they get quotes from the leaders, and, it, and they, they paper over the differences. But actually, like none, of the, none of those organizations, none of the famous Jewish organizations, would say to you that the um, United States should condition aid to Israel on the basis of Israel's behavior with regard to the peace process. But the vast majority of American Jews think it should. Um, and, and yet, the people who disagree with this feel very strongly about it and don't want to hear about it, and it would start a fight if we, you know, if a rabbi were to give a sermon on either side of that issue. So it's, it's best to avoid it. So that's what I mean. Israel, for many, many years, united American Jews, I think very helpfully. Um, American Jewry would have been in a lot of trouble without Israel to pull it together for decades. Um, but now I think it's become more divisive than uniting. So I, I think maybe like the elevator pitch version of the book, if I had to condense you know, 500 pages into like a question that's going to end, is this more or less right, uh, is that American Jews and Israelis really are you know, two tribes, as it were. And that, that's not a controversial position, right? Daniel Gordas, who's um, on the right, who lives in Israel, came from yeah. America, has written basically that as an op-ed and a book, you know, several times over the last five or ten years, saying that American Jews just don't understand what's happening in Israel because in Israel, Judaism is experienced in terms of national identity. In America, Judaism is experienced mostly as religion, and because of that, there's just an incompatibility. What um, I, I would I, disagree, though, with the word religion because most American Jews are not religious. It's a, it's a cultural or ethnic yeah, identity. It's a, it's, right, it's an ethnic culture. It's an ethnic or cultural identity. Okay, that, that's fair. Um, what you're saying in the book, I think, is that that's been true since the very beginning. That was true even before the establishment of the state. And the two were always kind of in conflict, except for kind of like a brief period when because of like a certain mythos about Israel that American Jews really wanted to accept. Maybe it was the thrill of victory in the Six Day War. Maybe it had something to do with the Cold War. For any number of reasons, American Jews kind of, um, they bought into the Israeli way of seeing the world, even though it's not really who they were in terms of most aspects of their experience. And then once a certain, you know, once enough time had gone by, things are reverting back to where they were back at the beginning. We're kind of coming full circle to the loggerheads between, you know, the Zionist movement on one side and American Jews writ large on the other side. Well, I, 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 I see some broad truth in that, but I have a lot of differences with it also. Um, I think what happened uh, to speak again very broadly, and I'm happy to discuss it in more detail, is that um, American Jewry, uh, it was uh, American Jewry was mostly Reform Jewry um, and some conservative Jewry uh, for its first, uh, until the 1920s and 1930s. Um, you know, all the Germans who came here in the 1840s and 1850s were Reform Jews. And then the Eastern Europeans overwhelmed them in numbers. Uh, there are about 250,000 Germans here, and then ultimately about 2 million Eastern European Jews came between 1880 and 1924. And, um, and these Jews uh, were not, they, they certainly cared about, their, uh, about the Jews who were endangered in, uh, in Europe, but they were much more interested in the United States and they wanted more than anything to be accepted in the United States. No other country had ever allowed Jews to be whatever they wanted to be. Um, and it was a thrill for them. And, and they, uh, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't want to appear different. Um, and, uh, and, and they were enormously successful in a very short period of time. You know, we had a Jewish Supreme Court justice and Jewish cabinet members. And, um, 
they were the model minority. And, um, and then you had the, the horror of the Holocaust, and, uh, and it changed the entire debate. Uh, most American Jews, up until 1920, 1930, were anti-Zionists. not that they were not Zionists, they were anti-Zionists, because they thought it called into question their uh, loyalty to America in the eyes of Christians. So um, now, uh, I, I'm someone, it's not going to be controversial for me to say this here, but it's controversial in some places. I'm someone who believes there had to be a state of Israel in 1948 for one important reason, which is there were 250,000 refugees from the Holocaust who had nowhere to go. They were living in, the, in, in what were still really concentration camps, except that they were, their lives were not being threatened. But they were living in, um, and no country would take them. So they needed a place to go, and that place ended up being Israel. You didn't necessarily need a state in theory, but you ended up needing one in practice. Um, so I, I, I think that, for me, that settled the question of Zionism. I don't know why we're arguing about Zionism or anti-Zionism. It's a settled question. There's an Israel. It's not going anywhere, you know, period. Let's talk about, you know, where we go from there. Um, but what happened, now, if you had looked at the, uh, the, state, the, the mission statements of American Jewish organizations, uh, right up until the uh, Six-Day War, you would find that they said very little about Israel, that they didn't concern themselves with Israel very much. The American Jewish Committee annual report of 1966 didn't get to Israel to page 35. There was no mention of it until page 35. Um, Nathan Glazer, a famous uh, sociologist, wrote a book called American Judaism. There's virtually no mention of Israel in the book on American Judaism, published, in, I think, in the late 50s. Um, but the Six-Day War changed everything. People felt like, oh my God, there's a second, possibly the second Holocaust. They're going to throw us into the sea. We let them down in the first Holocaust. By the way, that quote, throw us in the sea, no one ever said that. But it doesn't matter. There were some other bad quotes. Um, and, and they felt like, OK, back then we were powerless. We were afraid. We're not going to be afraid this time. We're going to make sure that we, in our, in our success and comfort and power in the United States, and our wealth can protect Israel. And, uh, and it gave American Jews a purpose and an identity that they didn't have before. Like I said, if you looked at the mission statements of most Jewish organizations, they weren't very different from most liberal organizations. Jews were just going to make America better. They were going to lead America to be a better America. That was the idea. But this all changed profoundly, virtually overnight, in 1967, where Israel became the center of American Jewish identity. When I say American Jews, I mean Reform and conservative American Jews, also Reconstructionists, which I happen to have been raised in. Not Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews always knew what they believed. Um, and, and I don't know what would have happened. I mean, what if history is dangerous business? But I don't know what would have happened if Ameri to American Jews if, if, uh, if that hadn't been the case. Many, many famous children, many children of many famous rabbis became Unitarians um, before uh, the creation of the state of Israel because they said, what's the difference? We, we, don't, you know, we don't really have any major differences with Christians and except over Jesus being... Uh, naturally born, and really, who cares about that? But the, the, the creation of the state of Israel and the focus on the Holocaust, which is, they're, they're inextricable, gave American Jews an identity and a sense of purpose and a sense of unity that they, they hadn't had in the past, and, um, and it's profoundly shaped, uh, shaped the American Jewish community today. What surprised me about the book, just moving gears a little bit, is there were a few parts in the book where you talked about how people's um, policies or people's ideologies vis-a-vis -vis Israel actually affected their politics in other ways. And I think the most striking example of that, maybe you can talk about that for a few minutes, is the rise of the neoconservative movement in America in the um, 70s going into the 80s, which as you talk about it, if I have it right, was almost a reaction by, you know, by Jews, by liberal Jews who were working as analysts or in government or as columnists or thinkers, yeah. who um, after the 1967 war, after the Six Day War, decided that they were going to be lowercase c conservative when it came to Israel 
And because of that, that pushed them along the road where by the 1980s, by the time Reagan came to the presidency, they were conservative, they were just conservative. Yep. And that was basically what happened. It wasn't that their ideology influenced how they saw Israel. They made a decision about Israel and that influenced their broader politics. Yeah, well this was, the, this was actually the source, the, this was the topic of my honors thesis in 1982, this exact question. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I'll speak personally for a moment. I, I, I thought I was trained, you know, I was 22 years old. I thought I'd been in training my whole life to be a Jewish, a liberal Jewish intellectual uh, of the kind that I had admired in the 1940s and 1950s that had been uh, centered around the magazine Partisan Review and also the early version of commentary. Um, and, that, and that here I was, graduating from college, I was ready to like step in, but all the resources and money had been taken over by neocons. You know, Com Commentary was an incredibly right-wing magazine. And, and, and Marty the Parrott's that, owned the New Republic. And Marty Parrott's owned the New Republic. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to say, how did this happen? So I, I wrote this thesis asking how did that happen. And my idea was that the 67 war had caused it. Israel had been David, and now it had become Goliath. And, and, and the United States, uh, you know, was on the side of... Um, Imperialism, basically. So I said, so I took the views of six intellectuals and I said, how did their views on Vietnam change after the 67 war? They were the anti Vietnam and they became pro Vietnam, as, as the neocons mostly did. Now, why did this happen? Well, uh, the Democratic Party, as everyone here I'm sure knows, turned against the war in Vietnam. In 1972, George McGovern gave that uh, speech, come home America. McGovern is the only uh, presidential, Democratic presidential candidate not to win a majority of the Jewish vote. And it's funny, I quote, I have a speech here from McGovern in that campaign saying, I mean, come home America, but not Israel. In other words, he was, uh, uh, liberal Democrats in those days were isolationists because they felt America was screwing up the world in Vietnam and, in, in South Africa, in Central America. But McGovern said, I don't mean Israel. Israel is cool. I'm fine with being in Israel. But people didn't believe him. They said, if, if, if he wants the United States to come home, who's, who's to say he's not going to say, come home Israel? Doesn't make any sense. Come home everywhere but from Israel. So, uh, so uh, people who, who didn't trust the Democrats, who really cared about Israel first and foremost, became uh, neoconservatives, and most of them, almost all of them, became Republicans. Um, now, what was, what's kind of funny about this is that every few years, Commentary or New Republic or, or William Sapphire in the New York Times, A.M. Rosenthal in the New York Times, today it would be Brett Stevens in the New York Times, they would say, choose. The Democrats hate Israel. Come on over to the Republican side. The water is fine. And the Jews would say, no thanks. We're sticking where we are. 75% of Jews voted you know, for Biden and Obama and Obama before that. Um, but the neocons managed to convince the Christians that they spoke for the Jews. So they represented the Jews to Christians, but not to Jews. Um, and uh, it's quite a trick. And, and it was very effective. And, um, I was going to say, it worked. Yeah. Well, it certainly got them nice careers and their children nice careers. All the, all their, all the famous neocons had children who also became famous, famous neocons. neocons. Yeah. So again, the larger takeaway is for the mainstream American Jewish community, right, Israel is not the answer in terms of Jewish identity. It has to be something else at this point, at least for the next little while. And the challenge of this book is trying to figure out what that is. Okay, I'll buy it. You'll buy it. Okay, Eric Alter, thank you very much. Thank you.